we're going to enjoy now a wonderful conversation between Professor Gavin Henderson and Carl Davis. Notes here somewhere. Yeah. Notes. Yes, a few notes. So. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was thinking of this, and I knew, yes, I did it. Right. Okay, <laughs> I thought you were going to take off so that I wouldn't have to do any interviewing. Um, however, I think we'd better begin at the beginning. And you were born in New York, yep. 1936. Yeah. Um, how did the music start? Well, apparently before I was born, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, the, the family legend is that my, my mother went to uh, a number of concerts uh, while she was pregnant with me, and that uh, I responded very positively to high sopranos, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> kick, kicked quite violently. Um, so they said, oh, must be a musician. <laughs> <laughs> were your parents musical? Then? Yeah, quite, but not, not musicians, but yes. they, were, they were musical, certainly music lovers. And my mother played piano, and, and my first experiences of ensemble playing was playing first the easy left hand, with my mother playing the right hand uh, part, and then as I advanced, we swapped positions, and I played the harder stuff. <laughs> but then, how was the music education developed? Uh, in those days, privately, there, there, uh, there was, <coughs> at least in, in um, so it's what, wartime what, what I would yeah. say, elementary school, uh, which is your primary school, um, uh, hardly anything at all, um, really nothing at all. And so it was always pursued, pursued privately. It was only when one, um, in the larger sort of high schools or secondary schools where, th where there was some, some instrumental teaching. But, uh, but most of my, my music was, uh, was going privately, wanting to do something, finding someone who could teach it, uh, that, that sort of and thing. And fundamentally is studying piano, is that it? Yeah, place? and yeah. then uh, I, I <coughs> wanted to study other instruments, and so it, when uh, I was a teenager I studied some flute, I had to play a bit of guitar at times professionally, a bit of organ sometimes professionally. Um, so, but it, it was it was piano playing and and piano playing in a very certain way. Yes, formal piano playing and, and learning piano repertoire. But also, I was very keen to expand on this and and uh, encompass uh, opera, musicals, ballet, etc. Et all playing. And I, I sort of made uh, gave myself the mission of being able to sight read play and sing a vocal part at the same time. It was a sort of mission. Fantastic. You know. And no conservatoire? Yes, a few. <laughs> 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 I was very promiscuous with my schooling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, the, first, the, the only sort of proper one I went to, which, which lasted one year exactly, was the New England New England Conservatory oh, yes. of Music in mm -hmm. Boston, which was actually very, very good. But I went there for a very specific uh, purpose, because I was fascinated by opera. Uh, and there was a very interesting opera conductor come director called Boris Goldovsky, nice. um, who uh, ran an opera course at, that, at the conservatory, as well as an opera course at Tanglewood, which is the summer festival associated with the Boston Symphony. And I wanted to get to him. And so I spent one year and Tanglewood. <coughs> he doesn't get mentioned in any of the, the sort of Wikipedia entries, but two people do, Paul Nordoff yeah. and Hugo Cauder. Cauder? Cauder. Cauder. Hugo Cauder. Yes, they, they were, they were the te my teachers um, uh, in, in my sort of late teens, early 20s. And the Nordoff connection is really quite interesting because um, he... Uh, shortly after I studied with him, which was in the mid, mid um, let me just see, it would have been the late 1950s, um, came to England and formed the Nordoff Robbins oh, yeah, yes. uh, therapy, therapy for autistic uh, and, and uh, children with difficulties. And uh, I remember um, 
meeting him in London, and he was really on the, in, in 1960. You first met him in London? No, 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 no. I met him at, at a college I was at, a very interesting college called Bard College, which was really a kind of hippie college, but in the mid-50s before it became fashionable. <laughs> <laughs> but something which really interesting, and then suddenly it's listed that you go and study with Pau Nilgaard in Copenhagen. Yeah, 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 I wanted, if there, if there are any Danes here, uh, you might be insulted about what I'm going to say. <laughs> but um, I, I desperately wanted to uh, have the experience of living in Europe. It, it's sort of a kind of backwards immigration. Um, and, um, and it's not strange, because I mean, London has a huge American population. Um, yes. And uh, it's very interesting, that mentality. I say it's, it's, an, it's, it's almost a nationality in its own, an American who wants to live in England and yeah. needs to live in England. It, it's, we'll it's develop quite that a, a bit quite more. An interesting, quite but an interesting why segment. Pan, I mean, I know Pan well, good quite well, but why did you, uh, I mean, well, it's, I, I it's actually a went pretty to recherche. Another, well, no, there, there, were, there were several reasons. One is I wanted to go to, I wanted to live in Europe, and I didn't want to go to one of the big centers. Uh, you, you, you know, what's the option? Okay, Berlin, Paris, Rome. Oh, she doesn't like me. <laughs> um, you know, I did work with Barry Humphreys, and yeah. he liked to torture his audience. <laughs> you see. So uh, that was a sudden slip into yeah. a, a Dame think, Edna sort of. I think she's from Copenhagen. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, perhaps she was from Copenhagen. Yeah. Uh, all right, this is, this, yeah, here yeah. comes the insult, here comes the insult. You're right. yes, I wanted to enter Europe through the back door. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if more Danes will leave. Um, but it, in a sense, I, I, at that point in my life, I said, would I go to Paris, would I go to, you know, to, et cetera. I was really scared of that. And it took a while for me to think that London was the place. Uh, you know, and, Nordoff was, was um, not, much, not much older than I was at the time. I was, I was in my early 20s. He's, he's almost contemporary. He had been recommended. Yeah. It was a question of recommended. But musically, he was far beyond anything I could even understand at the time. Um, and, uh, but, but he was good. He was good. He gave me some good tips. But <laughs> what about Nogard? The study Nugard, with, with Per, per Nogard, yes. I mean, he's... He's, he's, he's a major something. He, yeah. He's really, really fascinating yes. now. I did make contact with him just a few years ago and said, I have no problems now with your music. <laughs> <laughs> Which was, he was nice about it. But was, <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, I'm still fascinated because your musical language, if you like, it couldn't be more different. Really. Yeah. And what was it to you that made you want to study I needed, with him? Well, there was counterpoint I wanted to go on with, and then <coughs> we, we started looking at compositions and orchestration, and, and you know, he, he just was a good, a good mentor. And I mean, very good at saying something like, you know, can't you make it more interesting? <laughs> 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 you know, I mean, that sounds yeah. rather banal. <laughs> that sounds rather banal uh, uh, thing to do, but th actually that's, that's quite a yeah. good thing for a teacher to say. I must tell you just a short story about him, because he came to teach for us at Dartington, the summer school, many years ago, and there was a very, very difficult and eccentric woman uh, who wasn't really good. His wife? All. No, no. no. <laughs> and he came, to, he came to see me, he said, what can we do? I can't teach this woman. I, so I went through all sorts of motions. Well, you know, she's paid her fees, she's done this. No, he said, it is quite simple, she must die. <laughs> 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 Brilliant. <laughs> you didn't get that treatment then. Yeah, I think it's, that's uh, superb. <laughs> <laughs> and so after Copenhagen, you go back to America? No, no. no. I wandered for a bit because be preceding, preceding uh, my reverse immigration, I, um, I was doing a lot of opera. I was playing, I was a uh, uh, rehearsal pianist and coach at New York City Opera, Santa Fe. I was coaching privately to a lot of, lot of high-flown high -flown singers, and I thought, I'm, gonna, I'm stuck here. I'm stuck here in this thing. If I'm working 12, 14 hours a day in an opera house, there's no time or room to conduct. It, no, to compose, I'm sorry. There you go. Already. But you did conduct. I did, but I did. But yeah. I, yes, that's later, that's yeah. later. <laughs> but the, um, um, my, my thought at the end of the Copenhagen experience was um, that uh, maybe I'll go back to opera, maybe I'll, I'll go back, and actually took a long train journey, 
Copenhagen to Vienna, 36 hours, um, you know, and thought, Vienna, why not? Um, and I knew some singers, knew some yeah. singers from America who were, you know, part of the drift. <coughs> uh, and they said, don't stay in Vienna, there's nothing here, N nothing new, it's all the past. Uh, and then I suddenly thought, there were great things happening in England at that time that really attracted me. First of all, you had a radio and television, um, and we're, we're speaking from the perspective of 1960, that was commissioning music. I mean, they were, they were you know, actively mm. giving composers work. Um, you had fabulous theater. It was the, uh, uh, actually speaking of Arnold Wesker, the, 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 um, the point at which I arrived, which was June 1960, he was having his trilogy performed at the Royal Court. Mm. Um, Joan Littlewood was in her heyday. I remember The Hostage was the first play. And you I did work for her, didn't you? Eventually. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that was like 10 years later. Yeah. Um, she was on the, on the point of doing Over oh, to Lovely War. That mm. happened a year later. Um, uh, you, you know, there just was so much going on, uh, you know, musically and in opera, that I thought, I wanted to do it. I want to, I want to go to Stratford and write Senates and Tuckets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, um, you know, I really, I, 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 I really ad, uh, adored it, wanted to do it. And, and so, in a way, it was, it was actually suddenly thinking, what am I doing here? Mm. Um, it, without, uh, staying in Vienna was, was retrograde, and uh, England seemed to be yeah. the place. We've got to move on a bit, because we could spend a lot of time talking yeah, about yeah. it, and it's fascinating, but yeah. I want to sort of get you into the professional bit. Yeah. Um, you're back in New York, and you write a, you work on a review? Review, uh, I really, in a sense, never went back to New York. Uh, um, but I did write a review at college, which was done off-Broadway, won, won an won Emmy. An, won an Emmy. Um, um, is it called an Emmy? No, that's television. I is made it? this mistake quite, yeah. It, uh, it, it, the uh, the off-Broadway is a... Never mind. OB. OB. It's an right. OB. OB. Yes. Right. Um, this uh, is 1959. Yeah, that's right. Just so we really track it. Right. Yeah. My collaborator, marvelously <coughs> gifted uh, writer. It's called Diversions. Uh, yeah. uh, it was called Diversions. Stephen. <coughs> uh, he came to you. He came to you um, uh, for the Spoleto Festival, and did a review there. And then in Berlin, his, he was from Berlin originally. His, his, visiting his mother, met a marvelous woman called Rene Gardot, oh, yes. who was. Um, also German, but had been saved, rescued during the war, was here, was in England. Um, Rene took him to a producer called Oscar Lewinstein, yeah. uh, and we managed to sell the review to Oscar. So but it did go to Edinburgh, didn't it? Yes, it, it then it, Oscar took it to Edinburgh Festival, then took it transferred to the Arts Theatre in 62. Yeah. A lot of people came to see it. A very high-powered agent called Peggy Ramsey yeah. saw it, took me on, and th the rest was history. And Ned Sherin. Ned Sherin came there. Ned Sherin was that was the week that was. But he, he saw he saw he saw, he the, saw review. the review yeah. and commissioned Stephen and I to write numbers for that. That yes. was the week. And, and Stephen wrote brilliant sketches. Did you write the, the theme tune? For no, that? No, 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 that was no. Dave Lee. Right. Yeah. Okay. No, no I wrote I wrote clever lyrics for uh, uh, tunes for jazz. Yes. Millie Martin doing quasi. Yes. Anyway. anyway. <laughs> Now, I'm going to just sort of a slight sidetrack because I don't quite know. I mean, you had a career as a pianist, and the first time that we met was in a, a group called, with a group called Matrix, that yes. had been founded by the wonderful Alan Hacker. Yes. I think we just need to spend a little moment paying All tribute right. to him. That was yeah. my brush with the avant garde. <laughs> 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 yeah. I thought it would be interesting. I thought it would be interesting. And there was, uh, can I tell this story? I've yes, never actually done this in public. Right, okay. Only privately. But the, the avant-garde, because this was, Alan ran a group, it was three clarinets, uh, percussion, and a vocalist, so the amazing Jane Manning. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we did principally contemporary music. And there was one, one moment when, which was fine, and I enjoyed it, and I learned a hell of a lot. Um, there was a moment, though, when I suddenly th thought, wait a minute, th th this is a little bit suspect, more than a little bit suspect. Um, IS, what is it, ISCM? 
What, what the, 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 the international... ISC. ISC, I'm calling yes. it, yes, with our, with our group. Uh, and uh, we were going to premiere a new work. This was in Bath? The, 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 was it? Um, it could have been yeah. in Bath, yeah. Um, we're going to premiere a new work, and I'm handed a strip of paper um, with a single line and a few notes, a row, basically a row, yeah, so 12 notes, but broken up, here's two, then there's three, then there's four. And I said, what's this? I don't know about this. What are you going to do? Like, how do we know to start, you see? I'm, I'm talking to Alan now, who yeah, is yeah. kind of music. He said, well, um, or how do you know to end? <laughs> how, does, how does it end? And he said, well, you sort of feel, <laughs> feel that we, we think we're coming <coughs> to the end. We, we feel to end. Aha, uh -huh, okay. Uh, and then, so everyone saw it, and I said, I don't really, I don't really, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And then everyone launched. Everyone launched into playing and singing. I said, what are they, what are they playing? Jane was going, oh, hi, oh, she was doing, <laughs> the saxophone was, the percussion was hitting. Yeah. You know, this is a great thing, and I thought, I, 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 <laughs> what, what, what do I do? So I thought, I'll venture, I'll get two notes, okay, is the first group. Dun, 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 dun. And the composer said, don't do that, don't do that. <laughs> I said, why, why? A and he said, it, 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 it sounds, too, sounds too euphonious, it sounds too nice, you know, don't play yeah. them. And, and I said, all right, I'll try to do, don't play octaves, don't play octaves. <laughs> you see, okay, I'll, and it was really scary, I didn't know. Then after a while I said, oh, well, I'll do the sort of thing everyone else is, is doing. And I sort of said, well, it's any length, it's any notes, it's, it's any time. And then I thought maybe if we were a group, which we weren't, a group that specialized in improvisation, so after a while you would develop something, maybe that was kind of fun. But we weren't. We were still a group that, you know, 99%, the composer wrote it out and, yeah. and did it. So I, I began to think that this is, this is bogus. <laughs> this is bogus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There were some good pieces that came out yeah, of that Yeah, there, there was some. I wrote uh, one. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but Alan was a great catalyst in no, that uh, time. He was an incredible musician. <laughs> um, dance. Dance. Um, well, I'm not warmed up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, that's great. That was a very early love of mine. And I, I always talk about thinking of that... Um, well, the silly story, if we're going in for silly stories, I always thought I would love to dance, like I would love to sing, but I don't have a voice, so, you know, oh, I have a voice, as w everyone has a voice, but um, and, anyway, uh, for only very specific uses. Um, the, uh, the dance moment came when I said, it, it would really be wonderful if I could dance, but I think that the first thing I should do, I, I, someone had recommended Eurythmics as a possibility. Mm. So I said, okay, we'll ring up. And they said, well, okay, uh, we have a class, and come, and wear tights. Ah. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, no one is to know about this. <laughs> I bought a pair of tights. <laughs> I waited till the house was empty. I put on the pair of tights and looked in the mirror and thought, no. <laughs> <laughs> So I didn't. <laughs> I didn't go ahead with But it. the career in dance developed. But, but what, what I, what I uh, wanted to do, and, uh, because I was obsessively seeing all the great things that were going on in New York in the, in the 40s and 50s. I mean, there's Martha Graham up the road, American Ballet Theatre, New York City Ballet, Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo, uh, all the studio stuff. I mean, it was a terrific period for, for American dance. Um, uh, was uh, when I had made the commitment to composition, which was many years later when I was 18, uh, uh, you know, I knew, I knew that I really would love to write for dance, and uh, that was really one of my chief aims um, uh, when I came to England. I had already seen uh, the British companies mm. who uh, had, well, the Royal Ballet, the, the then known as the Sadler's Wells, no, it made the hugest impression in New York in, in um, I think, 49. 49 was the first year they were there. It uh, was the Vic Wells Ballet, I uh, think. Uh, yeah. No, no they, they, were, they were Sadler's they Wells become Sadler's at, at that point. Yeah, right, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so, so I, I, I am, 
I got my innings later in life. I got my innings, and, and, I and I've now written a lot of ballets and, and done a lot of work in dance. And that's of incredible excitement. The, the things that you don't know if you're not inside, though perhaps many of you are, is um, for me, the, the, the thrill is the studio. You know, the thing is to, perhaps I've written the piece, written a piece, or written a dance, um, and to actually then go to the studio, and there is the choreographer and the <coughs> dancer or dancers, uh, and you're going to play. And I, I, I tend to brush the, <laughs> this, the accompanist away and say, please, please, please let me play, show you what it's like, you know, and so on, Tempe. Um, uh, and, and, so, and the thrilling moment when you play the thing that you've written and someone starts to dance to it, or the choreographer indicates what the choreography is and so on. And uh, that is the pièce de résistance for me. Now, interesting, the relationship between the composer and the choreographer, um, how much of a tussle do you ever have in terms of the pace and, you know, the, the, the you hear the music at a certain speed, or are you happy to have it taken at whatever the dancer <laughs> prefers? There's uh, enormous variation in, uh, in my experience of the uh, relationship between composer and, and choreographer, and, um, uh, and for the dancers as well. Mm. Tempe, Tempe is a <coughs> continuous crisis, because if, if um, a, a piece of music is choreographed to uh, a particular tempo and you're not there, they're not there to, you know, to start with the, this is the way I've conceived it. Um, it can r really be quite distorted in terms of, in terms of what my original intention, mm. intention was. And I've learned to live with this because um, dancers can be extremely uh, subjective about uh, what <coughs> they are. And I once, one of my rare rare excursions into conducting uh, repertoire. So I was engaged to conduct performances of Giselle. Now, this is a ballet you probably all know, but the point is that from the insider point of view of conducting for, for, for ballet, this is regarded as the most difficult assignment because of the variation and variety in which people dance it to. And you have to be very, very careful how, uh, how you do this. So I was advised by a friend they say, really, what you need to do is uh, to get to know the dancers and perhaps before the curtain, um, be on stage with them and see how they're feeling, you know, and, and they, would, they would do this. And I thought, okay, this is an interesting lesson. Uh, I'll do that. I'll, I'll take this advice. So people were coming over and they were showing, dancers would come over to me uh, and say, a little faster here, a little slower there, and so on. And, um, and of course, uh, how would they know how fast or slow they're going to do? <laughs> that, that the question of how you are physically. Are you tired? Are you uh, nervous? Are you, yeah, nerves generally mean that you go faster. Um, uh, tired means you go slower. You know, how are you today? And they really won't know until they start to dance it. They really, really won't know. And the, the, the art of it is actually to simply be sensitive to what is happening in front of you. Mm. Um, so uh, this was really a bad move on my part. And I later consulted uh, a very experienced ballet conductor who said, uh, and I said, I go on stage, and he said, well, what I do is go to my dressing room and lock myself in. <laughs> 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 Which I began to think was the, was the right idea. Yes. Yeah. Did, you, did you feel you had a particular relationship with any uh, of the companies or choreographers? Um, I'm... Uh, Recently, um, had some had a marvelous experience with um, David Bintley at the mm. Birmingham Royal Ballet, who uh, brought me in to actually rewrite an entire score from start to finish of his Cyrano de Bergerac mm. ballet, and uh, uh, that 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 was very interesting. Now, for instance, as a, a uh, as opposed to being there in the studio, David absolutely bans me. For <laughs> me in the studio, he said, "You make me do. Do you want? Do you want me around when you write your music?" I said, "Well, I don't mind actually." But, uh, <laughs> but, but uh, so, uh, so my really thrilling thing of the creation is it. And so the tempi in his production sent to be his tempi, not yes. mine. You know, and uh, and, and he that's works very, very on funny. that with the with the MD, then I suppose. Well, yeah. he he just 
Go, it, it's very interesting. Someone plays, plays the, 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 the thing, and he sort of goes with it. Yeah. And, um, and I then uh, witness to the result, you know. <laughs> that, that's hard. But it, the, 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 the Tempe is really the, the, the critical uh, uh, element in, yeah. in conducting for dance. We've still got a lot to fit in, and we've got okay. to be over by okay. half past. And uh -huh. How are we doing? How are well, we doing? no, we're about okay. five past, and All we right. want to give a little time for people to have some questions as well. Uh -huh. So people uh -oh. got things they want to raise, uh -oh. think about it. Yeah, but that's we dangerous. need to get into the film world, I think. Yeah, yeah. And how the, the particularly the silent film world. Yeah. I mean, there's a name that I always think of in connection with the silent films, which is Kevin Brownlow. Yes. Um, who's a wonderful, I mean, a hero, but not really very largely known for being the figure behind it. I think also Jeremy Isaacs was mm. played an important part. Very important. But what seems to interest me is this is something that grew up in all these great films, Hollywood movies and so forth. This is a phenomenon that really seemed to have started in London. Yeah, with me. Yeah. <laughs> Happily. Um, the, the root of that was a television series called Hollywood. Uh, and it, it was made by a company that doesn't exist anymore called Thames Television, which you, you may, yeah. may remember. Um, I had in the early 1970s, uh, actually 1972 was the broadcast, done a series called The World at War, which you, you might, you might mm. have seen. Um, oh, yes. Thank you very much. Um, and that was Jeremy, wasn't it? That was Jeremy. So very, yes. very inspiring man, Jeremy Isaacs, who was... Um, well, his, the, the one, one of the last things he did was uh, to, to create the Sky Arts Channel, I mean, but that mm. was kind of a kind of in retirement thing. But what he had done before was, was uh, be, he was head of programs at Thames Television and later controller of Thames Television. And uh, he, he created the series The World at War and then went on to create the Hollywood series, which then gave rise to the Thames, what became Thames Silence, which became Channel 4 Silence and is now just Silence. <laughs> um, um, yeah, Jeremy, Jeremy is, is a genius figure and a very, very visionary, visionary man. And uh, he had this idea about involving Kevin Brownlow, who was a film director, film historian, who had written a book um, called The Parades Gone By, which was an, a joke, I mean, really, phone directory, um, of uh, history of silent film, but with an enormous number of interviews with people, because through this was written in the 60s, there was still a lot of people around who he could talk to, and it covered the entire range of producers, directors, lighting people, cameramen, and, of course, the actors. Um, so it was a terrific source material, and he commissioned from his position in terms, uh, Kevin to actually make this series called Hollywood. Uh, and I kind of moved from having done World at War to mm. the next project, which was, which was this. At the end of um, this series, so of course uh, the, the research and the work on it was, was really marvelous. There's so many treasures were, were revealed. And also the way in which the people, the musicians in the, in the uh, 1920s went about uh, creating music for these films. So there were, again were a few we could meet still who were, who were practicing. So were they, those great films like Napoleon and so forth, was the, was the pre-existing music or was it people improvising to the films in those days? Um, the, the, the theory is this, as the industry <coughs> grew, it, I mean, it may have started with, with a piano or an organ, but as it grew, even from the, the, the first decade of the 20th century, uh, you know, you, you suddenly, they, they, they wanted to have orchestral music or, or something. I mean, the photographs of things saying, we have an orchestra of five, we have an orchestra mm -hmm. of seven. When you got to uh, <coughs> kind of teens, um, something like, say, let's say 1915 is a good year, that, which was the year uh, of Griffith's Birth of a Nation, he hired the Los Angeles Philharmonic to to play the score, and so the first it started, you look at the score of Breath of a Nation, and it's the Norma Overture, yes. you know, and so on, into Wagner, into Valkyries, into Freischitz Overture, into, you know, a vast variety of classical pieces, as well as arrangements and all this sort of stuff. So that from the days of the great cinema, the big picture palaces, you know, the pe pe people were expecting to hear an orchestra, and that is what I was able to discover while 
you know, the, the actual music and their methods. That's what I was able to discover while working on the Hollywood series. When we got to the broadcast of, uh, of the Hollywood series, which was 1980, uh, I said at a, at a party, but it had already been in the air, I said, now that I have written over 300 clips for you, clips being the Argo for, mm. for the little bits cut out of the film, uh, little excerpts, um, now, that I, now that I've done this, why don't we do an entire film? We know how they did and we know, you know the, the, meth the method. Why don't we do a whole film? And at that time, Kevin was kind of working on th this, this lifelong obsession with this film called Napoleon, which is uh, uh, directed by French director Abel Gans, intended to be six, six-hour films, <laughs> the, the entire life. Yeah. Um, Abel Gans making this in 1927, the film company was already bankrupt by the time he got two-thirds of the way through part one. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, and uh, thought he'd have an extraordinary ending, at least as if, if this is as far as he was going to go. He'd only gotten to 1797. Um, uh, invented this, ex what w we know of as a kind of cinerama, a triple screen that the, 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 uh, across the curtains drew from the single screen, revealing two side screens to make this huge screen, and developing a, a half-hour finale to this film, which went from one single picture across the thing into three screen montage, alternating between the two. Absolutely stunning effect. And of course, not seen since 1927. Mm. So he, he oh, from his teenage years, um, was working on this film and, and by 1980 had reached just a few minutes under five hours. Um, and this was the choice. This was to say, we'll do Napoleon. Uh, and th th that perf single performance, November 30th, 1980, um, mm. changed history. I mean, in, in, in terms of myself, but also for the whole vehicle of Siren Film. We, we actually created that one night of actually seeing this great, great film, a full symphony orchestra playing my score, or create it, I like to say, a borrowing from the first person who did it, which was Otto Honegger, by the way. Um, right. he, his credit on the, uh, initially was crié, so created, I say, so I can say created by Carl Davis, uh, in my version, um, uh, which, you, you know, was, which not only did I write for it, but an enormous amount of arranging of uh, things like uh, all, the, all the Civil War, so all the, sorry, all the revolutionary, um, uh, songs, but also appropriate classics, so that you had, uh, I mean, who was there? To, uh, let's stick to the life of Beethoven. Uh, you know, all, you know, some good boys. I mean, mm. Mozart, for, for start, you know, yeah. Mozart, Haydn, and so on. And then uh, quite an enormous list of, let's say, one step down from the top. Um, uh, and it became a very, very interesting kind of dialogue for me be between the history of music at that time Late, late 18th century, you know, um, with the look of the film, the, everyone, the, the powdered wigs, the corsets, the, you know, the whole look, of, look of, of, of that period, you know, and hearing music of that period. Is there not some sort of restriction over Napoleon and it's o the, oh, own, oh, the ownership of the film you, itself? You know the so phrase, there's no hit without a writ. Yeah. Yeah, there is. The Coppola family, is it? The, the Coppola? Coppola family, yes. yes. But we will be able to hear your Napoleon In again. England, you can see mine. But nowhere else? No? Not without groveling yeah. <laughs> and threatening and yes. yeah, going through a whole performance. So I've decided the only way to proceed is to, s is to announce this is the only place you can see yeah, Napoleon. Yes. <laughs> so it's a whole issue that really does There is an issue. It, it, yes. it, it, is, it is caught. It, yeah. it is stuck. But nonetheless, and I'm, I'm here to announce that uh, I have just completed the DVD and Blu-ray version yes. of the film, and a CD as well, and that will be released uh, in November of this year. Yeah. So, uh, and it may even be playing at your local cinema. Hands up, people who have actually attended a performance of Napoleon. Oh ho ho, a veteran. Just the one. 
You've all got no, such an amazing treat in store. I mean, if it, if, when it comes round, and when it comes round with a live performance, hopefully with the Philharmonia. November 6th, yes. Festival yes. Hall. Be I'm there. Plugging. I'm plugging. Be there. Yeah, it's be it's there. a tremendous experience. Mm. With a dinner interval? There is. There has yes. to be. Yes. Uh, yes. yes. We're, merc we're sort of merciful to the audience, and we actually take three intervals. Because yes. now the film has, has, has expanded. What was um, about four hours 58 in, in uh, 1980 is now five hours 35. Yes. You see. So we, we have three intervals, and the second one is, is an hour and a half. Terrific. We could talk a lot about all the other films, but yeah. I think Napoleon is the sort of emblematic Yes, it is. That, piece, that's central. Yeah. Because what happened is, you know, film festivals, you could think of in, in, in many ways. Uh, some, it, the, our point of view was that it's a place where you go shopping. You know, people from <coughs> other film festivals turn up, or arts festivals equally, and see, you know, and go shopping. And what happened, what happened is that the films, uh, after because uh, actually there's an intermediary story to go, which actually closes the Jeremy Isaacs right. uh, thing, is that at that performance of Napoleon 1980, Jeremy's new job was founding Channel 4. He was the first five years of Channel 4 <coughs> were under his, under his um, banner. And he said, at, uh, I think at the, at the lunch interval, um, or dinner interval, um, he said, I will commission a series of restorations of silent film classics with music by Carl Davis for Channel 4. And that was the, the, yeah. the first move into the, a wider repertoire. And we recorded, and we did uh, the, our first go with Napoleon. So the, the, he had a couple of broadcasts mm. of Napoleon as well. But that, the, the wider implications of that is that we were, were repeatedly doing a, a, a big repertoire of film. Uh, initially, at one point, we were doing three a year. Uh, for broadcast, but also I made, for live performance as well. I made sure that I would be able to perform these things live because rather than, in exactly the same sense of that touch of life that I said when I described in a dance studio of that moment when you play, you play, the choreographer has his response and gives it to the dancer to interpret. The same thing happens when you see a silent film with live orchestra. And that point of contact in which I'm conducting, in my experience of conducting it, created the score to synchronize with the film. When I achieve that synchronization, like as rarely happens, starting at the beginning. Because yeah. <laughs> the whole thing, of the start of, a, of these films is fraught with difficulty. Um, uh, that moment is, is that point of contact, that point of life giving that is very, 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 very precious. Um, now, we're going to have to cut. Okay. We've got quite a bit. <laughs> Still want to give some time for okay. some questions. But I'm going to try and roll about four questions into one, uh, which is about, you know, what next. Um, you've written a number of what might call concert works, a clarinet concerto, a flute fantasy, and as a symphony. Um, you've written a number of musicals, mm -hmm. um, but you haven't written an opera. I have, actually. Have you? Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Um, I, it was for television. Um, it, th there was a moment when a, a very enterprising Canadian um, man called Sidney Newman, uh, who uh, did, um, did the uh, drama department of, of ABC television way back way back, early 60s, yeah. which was very good. Uh, I did a musical for, 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 for him. He then became head of the drama department at the BBC TV um, and commissioned, commissioned an opera. And it was called The Arrangement. And it was broadcast one night only. And on ITV that night was Night of a Thousand Stars, sort of led by Mar Marlene Dietrich. I mean, that's luck, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Marlene Dietrich, yes. Um, but and is it, it had one broadcast. I mean, is it a genre you would like to explore further? Yes and no. Yeah. Um, which is why I haven't. <laughs> All uh, right. I, I think that the one obstacle, we're getting very theoretical now, you know, but the one, the one obstacle I have 
about opera and going and, and going uh, new opera, let's say, because old, uh, already written, I mean, sort of Puccini on back, um, uh, it, you know, is absolutely fine. In my, I mean, thrilling, wonderful, and we we get it. In modern terms, the way people use their voices to sing. Wagner, Verdi, etc. This the, the the vocal sound that to me jars as as a contemporary sound doing mm. doing doing the, the 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 ability to actually use text and uh, character and so on to it, it, to it, to an artistic end. I think is very much in conflict. The conflict between vocal projection, vocal production, that voice, the operatic voice. Um, uh, conflicts to me with mo modern theatre and, 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 and modern thinking. Right, now we're going to close on just one thing. And Perhaps then a more positive note. Yes. <laughs> no, which is just a reflection on the Liverpool Oratorio with Paul McCartney. That was a great experience. That was a great experience. I imagined myself the fifth Beatle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't. It was that was long. That was long gone. But what I what I did experience at its at its best when we were going, and it was a real you know the the the, the uh, traditional picture. You know, I'm at the piano. Paul's sitting next to me. Sometimes he's he's at the piano. Sometimes etc. Et putting the thing together. Um, it was something we did together. I have to emphasize that. Something we did together is. The, the, you, the conventional, conventional way of composing vocal music is uh, a poet or a writer writes a text and the composer sets it. Generally, totally separate enterprises and so on. If you go into the world of pop, it, nev it seldom happens that way. The question of a melodic shape, a text that is part of it, the, the, um, the whole way the, the song is created is almost totally opposed to that idea. Yeah. It's sort of, you get an idea, it germinates, it grows into something, what's the next thing that should happen, etc. Et it's more like that, it's much more organic in its, in its, uh, cre in, in its creation. And it, w working with McCartney actually ta taught me that. Uh, you know, that it was very interesting following him through, I was part of it, you know, maybe I say, well, what, it, should it go up, should it go down, what about this chord? But it, the whole thing moved in a piece, so that at one point we, we ventured on one scene because as it went along, we suddenly had a story and we had characters, and it became quite well operatic. Quote um, uh, is, is that he was a actually able to produce the vocal line and the text simultaneously, and I thought, great moment, hmm. great day in my life. That he was, actually that lives just down the road here. You've probably been to his house. He's not there very much, but no. anyway. But he did actually one exciting moment. He just walked in through the door and bought a ticket for a matinee. Yes. And that yeah, was a that was pretty great, great. Yes. Yeah, anyway, no, no, that's he that. He does that. He would right. Do that. Questions. We've got about, well, we've got just five minutes. Just wait for the microphone, I think, probably, because yeah. we can't quite hear you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sir Carl. Fascinating to listen to you. My name is Simon Dolson. Uh, I'm a professional organist and a cinema organist, indeed. Uh, it triggered a lot of thoughts, uh, uh, your conversation. Uh, alas, uh, John Moorhen, uh, the ex-president of the ISM, is, is not here. Um, my question is twofold. Once, uh, one is that uh, I wondered if you'd ever been to the establishment club. Okay, the establishment you, club. Have you ever been to the... In Soho? Yes, yes, yeah. yes I did. And no. did you ever get uh, to meet I, Dudley Moore? I'm sorry? Did you ever get to meet Dudley Moore or Peter Cook? D David... Did you ever get to meet Dudley Moore or Peter Cook? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Fascinating. Uh, I wondered yeah. what you it's thought thrill of thrilling. them. Thrilling, yeah. Um, uh, oddly enough, the collaborator I mentioned, um, uh, Stephen Vinnie, uh, did some work, uh, wrote some reviews and, and directed, I think he produced some cabar cabarets there, Annie Ross, I remember uh, Libby Morris. Uh, so he, he did some work there, but I, I, I went there purely as public, you know, just to just to enjoy it. And um, but I did. I actually had to play. The, uh, Dudley wrote wrote a ballet uh, for uh, based on the owl, and the, uh, owl, the owl and the pussycat <laughs> for Gillian for Gillian Lynn uh, to choreograph. And I was act actually pl played some performances of it because it was for a company. Now def long defunct, called the Western Theatre yeah. Ballet, and became and Scottish and Ballet, and it became Scottish Ballet. That's right. Yeah. 
Second part of the question. Fascinating. And the other part of the question was, I just wondered what your view, um, as uh, I know various people, uh, uh, you know, that little port bound to Oxbridge, which is a nonsense. Um, I wonder what you thought of uh, Stephen Sondheim. Oh. What do you think of Stephen? Oh, I, I admire him fan? enormously. I admire him enormously. Thank you. Uh, m m more and more, actually. Mm -hmm. I, I, I started by thinking, you know, where is the tune? Yes. <laughs> uh, but, um, but in fact, th there is one, and it's worth, it's worth hearing a few times and, and, and getting there. I've, uh, and I tell you, when I really fell in love with Sondheim's work is, is when I started conducting it uh, and playing it. That, that, that makes an, eno an enormous uh, difference. It, it, it's fabulous stuff. Anybody else? Yes? And then over there. Yeah. It's a purely practical question. Uh, I think you said November the 6th was Napoleon, is that right? November the 6th, Napoleon? Yes. yes. Festival Hall. Um, is there any chance that that could be the subject of a simultaneous uh, broadcast around all these wonderful cinemas that we now have? Uh, we have one in Exeter. And the idea of a uh, it'll be a marvelous, like the well, I, a the, marvelous opportunity for us to be able to see it with, without it only being here in London. Mm. Sorry, what is he saying? He said, is it only going to be here in London? But I think you want to follow up. Um, on that. At the moment, at the moment, uh, the, the, that, oh, as far as its cinema distribution, uh, I think the plan of the, of the BFI, British Film Institute, uh, the BFI, uh, that their plan is to, is to distribute it, is, is actually to, you know, make it for hire, you know, pr pr present yeah. it as a commercially viable thing. Was it over here? Yeah. Good morning, Sir Carl. Very great admirer of your work. Um, I, I hate to disillusion you, but I think the fifth Beatle might have been considered to be Sir George Martin, who <laughs> sadly <laughs> died recently. <laughs> R.I.P. Um, but my question would be, your compositional process, you said about sitting down at the piano and playing and so on, but would you ever just sit down literally with a blank canvas and a pencil and, and compose in that way, or Sibelius or Finale, whatever? How, how would you sit down and start to write music? The blank sheet. A blank sheet, yes. A, a deadline is useful. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm, I am, cr in one sense, chronically lazy. Uh, you know, so if, if I need the demand, I need the, the request, with, and, um, and sometimes I have to create it for myself. You know, say so I give myself the deadline, and yeah. then I usually... But it's it, actually it's, how, it's do very you, how do you embark? How do you start? Yeah, how do you start? How do you start? Yeah. Well, um, I'm, going, I'm going through, the, uh, oddly enough, the, the, uh, have you heard of this um, marvelous uh, man called Oliver Sacks? Yeah, yeah. He, he, um, he, he wrote a book about, about um, the influence of music uh, in, in, a, in a psychiatric way. And, and he thinks it's, it's, it could be chemical. He thinks that, that it's, it's things happening in the brain at a particular moment. And, and that's what it, I don't. I don't really. I don't really know. I'm. I'm at the phase where, uh, a de if, even though it's, it's it's sort of a joke about a deadline, but in fact, you know, it's sort of. I'm. I mean, I'm. I'm in a situation now, uh, where I have. Uh, I have a deadline, and I'm working on an animated. An animated film, which which I could say is a process that never ends. I mean, it ends when someone actually rips it away from the animators, um, and. Uh, uh, just last, uh, and it's, uh, it's involving a great deal of rewriting, trying out, sending to people, then sending back. Of course, it's, it, it, this is all in today's world. It doesn't involve taxis. It, it's, it's, it's all down the line. It's, it's an incredible, incredibly useful. So you sort of think, well, um, I responded to uh, one section of a man whose wife was, was giving birth. And he's, he's on the street, and he sees the doctor's car, and he has to run and uh, run through the house, etc. And I did one version which was highly dramatic. Being a father myself, that, um, that seemed to be a <laughs> the terrifying news <laughs> and the process, you know, struck me as something highly dramatic. Then he came back saying, but it's only having a baby. Is it only having a, you know, you don't know, <laughs> you don't know, um, you know, and, uh, and they say, can it be lighter, can it be whatever, and so you say, okay, 
lighter. Mm. Okay, thinks. You know, and, and, and uh, incredible deadlines. It's got to be ready for a certain time because the producers are going to view it next Monday and this is the, well, everyone's working like mad to get it right. And I sort of said, well, okay, I will think of another. And I just said uh, uh, something about, I don't know, desperate pizzicato strings. Why? I don't know. Bloop, 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 bloop. You know, he's, he's, he's running, he's panicked. Bloop, 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 bloop. Um, and I do it. And I think they, they'll think it's too silly. They, they'll think it's absolutely too giddy in camp, you know. Um, so at any rate, news on the phone, on the, en route here, in the car, phone ring, you say, they liked it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and <coughs> it, it's stuff like that, and that, that serves to kind of push me along, yeah. push, me, push me into doing it, and my, I, I, in, it, it, I mean, everyone's character of, of anyone creative is, is, dif is different, you know, how, how they respond to that. And I, it, it turns out to be a sort of stimulus for me. We've run out of time. There's a lot more I wanted to okay. talk about. I'm, last, I'm a last, series. What can I say? <laughs> last, last train to tomorrow? Ah! So That's we might just else. have, we, shall we just finish on last train to okay. tomorrow? It seems okay. appropriate. The Halley in Manchester have got a superb children's choir. Very proud of it, they are. And uh, every year they commission a composer to, to write of all, of all styles and e extremes. And they wanted the, um, uh, John wanted, uh, wanted one for me, um, John Summers. Uh, I said, if I would, and I said, I, I adore writing for children. I've done a lot of work, work with children. And the one subject that interested me, which was about children, is the story of the kinder transport, mm -hmm. which was, for those who don't know, the few who don't know, uh, the uh, saving of up to 10,000, over 10,000 Jewish children in 1938 and 39, a deal between the Nazis and the British uh, to in sealed compartments from Vienna, Prague, and Berlin to bring them to uh, England, which stopped in September 39 when, uh, the war, the, when war was declared. So this, this theme haunts me. And uh, I, know I know people who were on those trains, um, indeed working in the arts, it would be hard not to know someone mm -hmm. who. Um, and I thought this was, a great, this was a great subject for children to do. In, in that context. So it's, it's a 45 minute work. Uh, I told John, I said, uh, it's, 40, it's half an evening. And it's been done, and it's about, it's about the journey. It's, it's restricted to the journey and the, the thoughts of the children as they move from their initial destination on the continent across to Liverpool Street Station, uh, which is the, was always the destination, except for the few who came by ship, etc. But in the main, it was tra the train. Um, and uh, we did it at a highly emotional performance about uh, three years ago now. Um, and since then, uh, I've had a chance to do it at the Roundhouse, uh, which was extraordinary atmosphere, mm -hmm. in Prague with many, pe many survivors there in Prague. And most recently, and mo very interestingly, in Chichester Cathedral on a Holocaust Memorial Day. Mm. So it's, it's actually writing a piece that has, as well as, yes, the songs are, are fun or moving or whatever, but it's a piece that, um, uh, again, has this electricity of contact uh, to, to a public. You know, it, it's very, very emotional and uh, experience. Well, that's a very poignant way to finish. Mm, thank Carl, you. thank you very much indeed.